is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. The Boston Globe tracked down nearly 100 high school valedictorians who graduated from local public schools between 2005 and 2007 and asked, where are they now? The answers paint a devastating picture of students who were underprepared and ill-equipped for the challenges that waited for them in their pursuit of higher education. Joining us today are two of the reporters on the project. Megan Irons, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And Malcolm Gay, we are glad you could join us as well. Thrilled to be here. Why did the Boston Globe want to tell the story? Well, it started on an editorial basis, and since 2005, we've been producing a Faces of Excellence page where we publish the names and faces and a little bit of biography of the city's valedictorians for that year. Ten years out, we thought we would try to catch up with them with the thought that, one, it would be interesting just to see where these kids landed, but also that it might actually tell us something profound about social mobility and what people are able to do post-graduation. We were really concerned about the growing income inequality here in Boston. Boston is a world-class city. People from all over the country come here for health care, for education, to work. We have a booming high-tech industry. And the question uh, I think the editors were asking was, what would it take for someone from a poor set of circumstances to climb into the middle class? And we decided to look at education because education, uh, as we know, is supposed to be the great equalizer. And our research took us to the valedictorians. For those of us who may not be familiar with the Faces of Excellence page, let's talk about what we look at, what we see when we look at those photos. What are the patterns there, Megan? When we look at the pictures, we see hope and we see young people with big dreams. We see your brother, your sister, or someone you know who are looking at education or going to college, working hard, trying to get to the next level. A lot of the people that we spoke with are immigrants. Some were refugees. Some were raised in foster care. And they are looking to our public high school system and through our colleges to really allow them to live the American dream. And when you look at the pictures, there's so much hope in the smiles that you see and in the dreams that um, you see in their faces. And I think we were sort of able to capture those dreams, and those dreams deferred. Um, And it it was hard to take at times. Malcolm, this is a really ambitious project. Obviously, you two were part of a big team at the paper that were on this. Reporter Eric Moskowitz also contributed heavily to it. Talk to us a little bit about how you divided up this reporting. So we started out, for the first couple of months, we enterprised and just started to reach out to various valedictorians, not in a random way, but just, you know, reaching out to those people that responded to us quickly. And as the project developed and Megan and I came on, we created a system by which we were going to try to reach every valedictorian that graduated between 2005 and 2007. Uh, So we broke it up by year. There were three of us. There were three years. So Eric took 2005, I took 06, and Megan took 07. And to find those kids, it was, you know, going online. Uh, One of the first things that we discovered was a lot of these kids did not have an online presence, which in this day and age really is is telling. So we ended up going through Accurate, Nexus, door knocking. We sent letters. We spoke with landlords. We spoke with family members trying to track these kids down and then would ask them a methodical series of questions so we could actually build a database uh, that allowed us to see broader patterns within the valedictorians that may not have been apparent if we just worked from an anecdotal perspective. Your story is very heavy on the statistics, and the statistics are devastating. Just a a quick summation, about a quarter of the valedictorians said they wanted to pursue medical degrees. So far, none of them are doctors. One in four had earned a bachelor's degree within six years of graduating. What were some of the other patterns that you were seeing right away, Malcolm? Well, I think one of the critical things, I mean, yes, we ended up reaching 93 uh, city valedictorians. We also spoke with 65 valedictorians from the suburban cities and towns surrounding Boston. So it's more around 150 valedictorians total. The idea being that we needed some sort of control to actually measure where these kids were. 
And in that suburban group, we found that that group was nearly three times as likely to earn $100,000 a year as the city valedictorians were, uh, whereas, as you noted, uh, there's not a single MD among the city valedictorians. There were eight suburban valedictorians. Uh, none of the city valedictorians had a PhD. There were seven or eight PhDs among the suburban valedictorians. They were just much more successful in measurable, quantifiable ways than were the city valedictorians. Well, that takes me to my next question. Megan, you've reported quite a bit on issues related to racism and inequality within Boston Public Schools' elite school system. Let's talk about that two-tier structure that exists for students. Well, in Boston, we have three exam schools that are educating a lot of our brightest and more talented students. And then we have the other high schools. And for years, there, the city has been in search of what to do with these high schools and how we can make quality education much more rigorous in the high schools that are not exam schools. The BPS school system has never been able to figure it out. What we have is a very, uh, as you said, a two-tier system. We have the exam schools, and then we have what our reporting said was mediocrity. And what we're finding is that Not enough is being done to ensure that the high schools that are not at the exam schools are as rigorous as the exam schools. BPS had promised to ensure that all the schools would have rigorous education, that they would double advanced placement courses. They have yet to do that. And it's still a question, you know, years past and even now, on how to bring those schools up to par or to the level of the exam schools, it's still a challenge for the city, it's still a challenge for the mayor, and it's still a challenge for the new administration at BPS here in Boston and for many urban schools as well. If I might jump in, previously, up until the late 1990s, there was a quota for the exam schools. 35% of the seats were reserved for minority students. In the 1990s, that was challenged, uh, and they went to a competitive colorblind system. And what you find is to get into the exam schools, uh, the students have to take uh, a test, and it's based on their GPA as well. But the curriculum at BPS oftentimes does not cover some of the things that are on the exam school test. And oftentimes, black and Latino students do not take the exam school test. So what ends up happening is that at Boston Latin, which is the city's flagship exam school, in a district where black and Latinos make up 75% of the student body, uh, they make up about 22% of Boston Latin School. So there's a drastic racial imbalance at the top level of this school, and that affects the entire system, I would say. What I thought was really important in your stories, and I encourage everyone to go online and look at the full project, there's video, multimedia, databases you can explore, is I really think you showcase that this is as much about the K-12 system as it is about any shortfalls in support systems at the college level, of which there are many. Yes. I mean, the big question, I think, is whose responsibility is it? to ensure that students who come from disadvantaged circumstances finish high school, prepare to go to college, and when they're in college, whose responsibility is it to ensure that they graduate? And are we doing enough? I mean, there, there are, if you talk to the colleges, the elite colleges, they'll tell you that they have scholarships and money and resources devoted to this particular group of students, and the education system will tell you that they're doing enough, but they're not. When you look at the national data, you'll see that nearly half of the high school students are not graduating. So obviously, everyone needs to really step back and ask, are they doing enough to ensure that the students who graduate high school are indeed finishing college? And I think this is a conversation that needs to happen now. It needs to happen as we go on because too many students are going to college completely unprepared and completely on their own. We're talking with Megan Irons and Malcolm Gay of the Boston Globe about the Valedictorians Project. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to everyone who's been taking a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and feedback is helping us grow. Malcolm, I want to turn for a moment to Michael Blackwood and why you feel he's representative of what your story called this epidemic of untapped potential. 
Michael Blackwood's an interesting case. On the one hand, he wanted to be a doctor, uh, like so many of the valedictorians. And his story, uh, where he's now a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army based in Okinawa, Japan, really embodies a lot of the struggles that the valedictorians that we spoke with uh, endured. He also is literally on the other side of the world from where he expected to be, not only professionally but physically, which is a, you know, kind of a gripping uh, just kind of image to really embody this story. Uh, But Michael himself came over here to the United States uh, after his mother had died in childbirth, decided he wanted to be a doctor, excelled in school, ended up with a full ride to Boston College, did reasonably well early on, but then cut by cut these tiny little obstacles, some larger, some some smaller, uh, began to build up. He ultimately lost his scholarship and had to leave school, gave up his medical dream and joined the Army. What's been the response to Michael Blackwood's profile? Have you heard from Boston College? No, we have not. We've not heard from Boston College, nor have we heard from the Boston Public Schools, interestingly enough. Well, that, that is interesting. We have not heard from anyone. I'd say that might be a case where silence is deafening, but that may just be me. <laughs> Megan, you profiled a number of valedictorians whose life paths have gone very differently from what they might have predicted for themselves in high school. Let's talk a little bit about some of the common themes there and how they see their own experiences. I mean, certainly they're not all angry. They're not all necessarily disappointed or or see themselves as failures. Tell us a little bit more about that. A lot of the valedictorians that we spoke with have overcome quite a lot. They are at a place in their lives now where they're sort of looking back and reflecting and all the things they did overcome and where they are today. I would think most of them are in a position at this point to think, what are their next steps? Um, the people that I've met and I've talked to, Trong Trin is one of them who dropped out of BC before his first uh, semester ended, is working at a T-Mobile where he manages a store here in Boston, and he doesn't want to be there forever. Some of the valedictorians do look back with some regret in terms of some of the decisions that they made or some of the advice that they received, whether it was from a high school counselor who told them to go to college to study pre-med with no prior background in it. And some looked at ways their education and college could have been a lot more successful had they had the right advisors or had they had the right resources It's something we all do when we reach a certain point in our lives where we look back and try to figure out how things could be better. But I would say most of the people that I've spoken with personally, and I'm sure Malcolm and Eric would agree, do not see themselves in any way, shape, or form as failures on any level, but see themselves as people really trying to navigate a very foreign system to them and have done the best that they can. And when you look at the totality of the project, you will see the grit, the resilience, the drive. It's amazing how far they've come in spite of all of the things they've had to go through. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. What are some of the solutions that are being floated that could maybe help the next class of valedictorians? Well, so to jump on to Megan's last point, I mean, one of the things that I found so interesting in all of our reporting, honestly, is, you know, these are people, some of them have overcome the Taliban, some grew up in villages with no electricity, overcame, you know, monstrous obstacles only to become the top in their class in the United States and then to be ultimately derailed by these very daily, small, little bureaucratic obstacles that, you know, to an upper middle class child would may perhaps not even be felt. They would be absorbed by the family. They would be absorbed by the social structures that surround them. And as Megan said, to underline that, you know, each one of these kids, but now young adults, um, you know, they may not be living the successful life that they had imagined for themselves, but they're, you know, nothing if not resilient. And they've kind of redefined success in their own terms. And they've reached a new type of success for themselves. And I think that that's, you know, one of the messages that I hope people are able to come away from this series with. You know, in terms of solutions that one could, uh, you know, that have been floated that I think actually might really work, there are a couple. The first, I think, within the Boston public school system, the state has uh, minimum requirements for graduation or recommended requirements for graduation. Uh, the Boston public schools could adopt those requirements. That would be, you know, a certain amount of, of science, a certain amount of math before you're eligible to graduate. 
graduate. At this point, these are simply recommended by the state, and Boston Public Schools students actually achieve those requirements at a rate of about 30 percent. Critical to all of this is mentoring, Uh, mentoring beginning in high school into the first two years at least of college. Earlier, one of the things that a lot of the students that we have, have interviewed had to deal with was, yes, they got this incredible scholarship. They had all of this money thrown at them. But once they got there, that scholarship was based on their GPA. And once they started to struggle academically, they had nowhere to go. They felt like they didn't have the agency. They felt culturally alienated and academically unprepared. And at that moment, they don't have anywhere to turn, so they either went into a new major, oftentimes an easier major where the jobs are not as plentiful or as lucrative, or they dropped out altogether. I think that there's been some work on this in the years since these kids were in college, but it's critical to play that role of an academic mentor, social mentor, to really help these kids, give them the supports that they need to really succeed, because it's quite clear that if you give these kids the tools to succeed, they will. I want to add to that as well, because I think the conversation for a very long time has been how to get these kids access to college and then how to get them through college. And now I think the conversation needs to be about how to prepare them for the workforce that is moving much faster than one would imagine, how to get them prepared to join the workforce that's out there right now. I think the colleges are beginning to take a look at this to take a look at their own responsibility and to ensuring that these students not only get the advice that they need and advisors to steer them, but also real work experience and internships and connections into the work world. What advice do you have for local education reporters who might want to use this project as a springboard but may not necessarily have the same kind of time or resources available in their newsroom? Well, I take your point that the Globe has made a real investment in this project, and both Megan and I are quite grateful for that and the the commitment to quality journalism that the Globe has made. I do think that this is the type of project, uh, perhaps in a smaller form, that could be replicated and perhaps should be replicated uh, in newsrooms across the country by focusing on the so-called best and brightest kids that will absolutely succeed if given the tools to succeed, it allows one to really look at the structural deficits and the structural impediments that face not only the best and brightest, but the rest of the students as well. I would say that, you know, if you don't have the time, we had a whole year to look into this, look at the stories, you know, look at your local high schools, look for places where there are inequities and write about those. Also, there's data available on a state level as well as the city level. And really look at those data and look at individuals that can tell those stories as well. You don't have to do this massive project as we did to be able to share the stories that our disadvantaged students are struggling or that our school system isn't doing a good enough job in preparing them for college or that there are requirements from the state that the school system is simply ignoring. It just means that you have to just dig a little deeper from your normal, you know, day-to-day coverage to tell these stories, and it can be done. It can be done. Megan Irons and Malcolm Gay are both staff reporters for the Boston Globe and joined us from their offices there. Thank you for making time for EWA Radio. Our pleasure. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story you want to know more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thank you for listening. Thank you.